My name is Robert Lamb. I'm the director of the program on crisis, conflict, and cooperation here at CSIS. Uh, thanks to all of you for, uh, for filling up this room today, and thanks as well to uh, all of you who are watching live from the internet. This will be the last um, C3 conference in what will soon be known as the old CSIS building. In two months, we're moving to a new building on 1616 Rhode Island Avenue, and I personally am very excited. It's got amazing new conference facilities, not to mention nice new offices. Um, there's an addendum in the program that, that uh, should be there. I, I would just uh, have you uh, take note of some of the program changes that, that um, ha we've had to undertake due to some unforeseen circumstances. Um, we have a great agenda today. Um, everyone who will be speaking today, um, all of the panelists, most of you here in this room and uh, watching uh, from the internet live today, um, are all involved in um, a, a very interesting field, um, involved in some way or another in uh, working to reduce violence and conflict, whether the risk of violence, to mitigate its effects, to prevent it. Um, the, the field, broadly speaking, has a wide number of sub-disciplines, whether you call it post-conflict reconstruction, transition, uh, stabilization, consolidation. There's a lot of different words, peace building as well. Um, but all of these fields have um, one thing in common. But all of us in, the, in these different sub-disciplines of um, peace building, stabilization, reconstruction, transition, and consolidation, what we have in common is that the demand for civilian powers is not going away. Um, public opinion uh, will wax and wane. Uh, we were for humanitarian intervention before we were against it. People were for counterinsurgency before they were against it. Um, the media might be with us, they might be against us. Um, uh, Congress might be providing more support, might be providing less support. But the truth is, there's always going to be conflicts. 
and the demand for the United States to do something about them isn't going away. But it doesn't mean the United States should be the world's police, it doesn't mean the United States should be intervening everywhere in the world. It does mean that there's always going to be pressure for the United States to do so, and there's always going to be temptation for the United States to do so, which means that once in a while the United States is going to, is going to intervene somehow. Now, there's a clear preference in our data set and, and through uh, the broad experience of most of the people in our field that the top, the top political leadership of the United States prefers to use civilian power um, to respond to these crises before they spiral out of control. We prefer not to use military power. There, there's you know, some notable exceptions, but the overall broad trend is clear. The problem is that the support given to civilian institutions to respond to and support transition, stabilization, and reconstruction work is really pretty poor. Um, so the demand for what we do in this field is not going away. And so we really better learn how to, um, uh, as a society, to support civilian power. Um, so that's the public message that we want to send, that the American people should not lose faith in this field. Um, they seem to be. Another message of this conference, though, and, and it's going to be a theme throughout the day, is that while we've had some successes in this field, we really do need to do a better job of giving Americans a reason to have faith in what we do. Um, in 1927, there was an economist named Alan Young. And what he said is that even an industrial dictator uh, with all the power to move capital and labor in the world could not compress a half century of normal progress into just a few years. That's a lesson that we've been learning over and over for 85 years. In 1949, the World Bank said that development and reconstruction of any society has to be led by the people in that society itself. And those of us in the outside world who want to support that can only support that. And we should coordinate with each other, and we should coordinate with the people in that society and their government. That's a lesson we've been learning for 64 years. The World Bank also said in 1949 that it's not just the capacity of the people who live in that society that's a constraint on their ability to reconstruct and develop and stabilize. It's also donors' blindness, our ambitions, our objectives, our assumptions, sometimes our arrogance, that sometimes we don't understand what's actually happening in the places that we're trying to benefit and so we implement things that we know how to do, and they don't work, and then we wonder why. And we've been learning that lesson for 64 years as well. Now, in those 64 years, we've done a lot of really great things in the world, um, not just in Europe and Japan, but more recently in the Balkans. Um, there's been great progress in Colombia and many other places as well. But the truth is, we keep learning the same lessons over and over. I was joking to a colleague last week that there's really only about 13 lessons in our field, and we just keep learning them over and over again, and every decade we just call them something else. Um, and the truth is, um, the, if you read the 1927 Alan Young, the 1949 World Bank, even Albert Hirschman in 1965, who said that what we think are constraints in a society that we're trying to help might not actually be constraints. The human capacity for creativity and survival is pretty enormous. And what we think should work in a place might not be what locals think can work in that place. That's another lesson that we've been learning for decades. All of these lessons sound suspiciously familiar if you read the Paris Declaration, the Accra Agreement, um, Busan commitments, uh, any other of these documents that, that, um, that we keep coming out with every few years. So I'd like to humbly submit a research agenda for our field. Whenever we do a program evaluation, whenever we do social science research about aid effectiveness, whenever we collect best practices and lessons learned, let's not just end with the policy recommendation that we should do X next time, where X is coordinate with the local population, or um, you know, let the host society take the lead, or fill in any one of the 13-ish um, you know, lessons that, that we all know. Um, we should do that, obviously. But don't stop there. Do a little more research. Ask, why didn't we do that this time? It's not like we didn't know. What we need to do is research on our own institutions. Not only 
you know, the good technical capacity assessments and needs assessments and political economy assessments of the recipient societies. It would be useful for us, um, for our own research agendas, to look at the political economy of our own organizations. Understand what's preventing us uh, from, uh, from understanding local population, preventing us from implementing a lot of the things that we, that every few years we tell ourselves we need to learn how to do. Because the truth is, conflicts aren't going away. We're going to be getting involved in these things um, uh, for, for many, many years over and over again. Our data set showed that uh, about every two weeks, two and a half weeks, there's a new political uh, crisis in the world. Um, it's, it's rare for the news to actually uh, uh, de demonstrate that, but this summer we've had um, you know, Syria, Turkey, Egypt, about every two and a half weeks. Uh, it kind of matches our data uh, very nicely. Um, there's a lot of other topics that our field should be looking at. Um, one of them is gender. Um, what you'll notice on our agenda today is that it's pretty male dominated. Um, a lot of the research in our field uh, in dealing with, with gender is treats women as victims, and there's a, a, a pretty rich and growing literature on that topic. There's a fascinating small literature on women as perpetrators of violence and conflict. It's, it's very fascinating. Um, and there's a new um, and growing literature and interest um, on women as peacemakers um, in conflict areas. And that's a, a line of research that really should be pursued pretty vigorously. Um, last week, the, uh, the Fund for Peace released their failed state index, and uh, uh, Krista Hendry, who's, who's here today, said that, that the 3Ds should be replaced by 4Ds, that it's not just development, diplomacy, and defense, but the fourth D should be data. Um, with the release of the new GDELT data set, uh, a quarter of a billion uh, data points, uh, who did what, when, where, with what attitude, um, geocoded precisely, um, this new era of big data, um, this is a new world. Um, mere correlations and regressions are not going to be enough. If you're going out in the field and you're collecting data and you're not geocoding it, you're living in 1995. If you then take that data and fail to share it with other people in a way that's accessible um, and aggregable, you're not being helpful. This goes to all of us. We've collected data. Now we've tried to make our data set available online as well. But Sharing data, aggregating our experiences, and especially geocoding it so we can pinpoint where it's happening and understand better the subnational spatial dynamics of what's happening in, uh, in our field is going to be critically important, and it's something that we can no longer afford to avoid. Finally, there's been a lot of interest in the private sector, uh, recognizing that in fragile states and in conflict and violent areas, that official development assistance has not made nearly enough progress there as it has in other places. And so now there's a lot of interest in, in wondering, well, maybe the private sector can do something that, that the public sector can't. There is indeed private sector activity taking place in conflict zones. We don't always recognize it as such. It's informal. It's, it's done by illicit actors. It's done in sectors that, that we don't quite understand. But it does happen. But we also need to be cautious. We can't believe that just increasing private sector activity in a fragile area or a conflict zone is going to automatically lead to good development outcomes. We have to study much more closely what the potential for positive spillovers are. How do you capture the positive spillovers? How do you, ca how do you avoid the negative risks of increased private sector activity in conflict areas? Now, these are topics that our program is, um, is actively engaged in. It's, these are topics that our program is actively fundraising around. Um, and these are, are topics that a lot of us should be collaborating with each other a lot more on. And I want to encourage that. Um, so today, as you, uh, as you listen to all of the speakers, uh, as you raise questions, as you talk with each other over coffee, I want you to think too closely about the two basic messages of the conference today, which is the American people can't lose faith in this field because the truth is the demand for this field isn't going away. And we in this field need to be worthy of their faith by continuing to rethink how we operate, what we're trying to accomplish, how we're studying it. So welcome. We have an exciting program today. And uh, thank you for all of your attendance. Thank you as well to IRD and AECOM for, uh, for co-sponsoring with, uh, uh, with us today. Um, thank you, Arthur and David, for your comments. And thank you, Dr. Hamry, for opening up today.